And then please remain standing as you are able for our reading from Scripture today from Romans chapter 8, uh, beginning in verse 15. For you did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear, but you have been received, for you have received a spirit of adoption. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God, for the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption for the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope, for who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And God, who searches the heart, knows what is the mind of the Spirit, because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. This is the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be be to God. God. Amen. And you may be seated. Again, welcome to University United Methodist Church. Uh, My name is Will Rice. I'm the Director of Communications and Media for the Rio Texas Annual Conference, the large organization of churches this church is a part of. I used to be a pastor here as well and uh, been invited back for um, a couple of weeks to uh, fill in during this time of uh, transition. I want to say a few words about Karen Andrews, who's probably trying... Oh, she's already gotten her seat. All right. Karen Andrews uh, is... Uh, this is her last day with us today. Um, she's moving on to, uh, to greater things in God's calling in her life. And that's why the, the children were all uh, here singing. That's one of her beloved ministries here at university. And what, what an amazing performance that they offered to God through you this morning, Karen. That was just amazing. So I want to say a few words about her, which I know she, she will love because uh, she likes people talking about her. Um, when I was a pastor here uh, during the time that I preached nearly every Sunday uh, in this space, Karen was with me almost all of those uh, Sundays. Uh, you got to see her face up here. And first of all, most people would agree that her face is a fantastic counterpoint to this face, right? Yeah, but more than that, Uh, The voice that she led in worship, whether it was her prayer, her leading us in liturgy, or just all those little parts that we don't pay attention to that are are how we sort of lead the flow in worship, added such a a voice of the Spirit here. Uh, She also showed and demonstrated a level of grace uh, unsurpassed because she had to work with me every week. You know, and you all know me and love me, but I can be a little bit difficult to work with. And um, you all don't know this, and I was never going to tell you, but um, during the closing hymn, as Karen would often stand over there at that lectern directing all of you and totally being in the moment and the spirit and leading the worship, I would often be standing down there making faces at her to see if it was possible to get her to laugh. It never worked. When uh, Karen transitioned in, into worship, she also took over all of the logistics of, of, of getting worship going in this place. And so she was simultaneously up here in front of you all, but also behind the scenes, making sure all of us got to where uh, we would go and do what we were supposed to do, which is not easy. Now, before she took over that job, though, when I came to university, it was the tradition 
that all of the pastors would be given up at the benches in the back a nice, fresh, cold bottle of water in case they became thirsty at all during the worship service. Now, when Karen, dear Karen, uh, took over uh, the job, Karen never did that. <laughs> e- ever. Uh, she tried once. I mean, she bought some water and you know, put it in the staging room. And finally, she just said, okay, I'm not doing this. Get your own water. And she, to this day, does not ha- know how incapable of simple tasks I am at, so I have been thirsty for a really long time. <laughs> but it's okay. But Karen is a, a dear part of this congregation. She will remain a dear part of this congregation. She was part of this congregation long before she took on the roles of ministry that she has taken. She's become a dear friend to me, and I know that we'll want to take a moment just to show our love and appreciation for Karen Andrews today. <laughs> And with that, let us pray. Gracious God, we are so thankful for these bright spots in our lives, for the people that you send to uh, lead us, the people that you uh, send to bring us joy and music. Lord, we thank you for this time of worship. Uh, We thank you for the children's voices that led us. And now as we turn to your scripture, we ask that you would quiet our minds and still our hearts, that through the power of the Holy Spirit, we might hear uh, what you would speak to us today, and that we would leave this place today a little different than when we walked in. We thank you, Lord, and we pray to you in Jesus' name. Amen. I think Karen really thought she was not going to have to go through that because I'm the least sentimental person she's ever met in her entire life. And she thought I would just be like, oh yeah, see ya. But sorry, couldn't do it. So I've been invited back for just a couple of weeks during this important time of transition. And uh, I got to start out last week with a great feel-good sermon on anger. Um, But don't worry, this week we can relax because I'm preaching on prayer. And everybody likes prayer, right? Yeah, okay. So here's what I thought we would do. I thought since everybody loves prayer so much, we would just take the microphone and go around the room and give everybody a chance to pray out loud. Now, don't trample each other on the way to the door. I'm not going to actually do that. But most good Methodists are not incredibly comfortable with praying out loud. Um, And, you know, I've always asked people about this because I just, I have to. I love it. It's part of who I am. Uh, But they usually claim uh, a number of things. Some just don't like to speak in public. But others say, well, I'm just worried I'm going to get it wrong. And let me just tell you, you're probably right. Um, (laughs) Prayer is a very serious thing. Because think about it, we open our mouths to use our very limited, tiny human words to speak to the creator of all that is. What could possibly go wrong? Now, I have figured out that there are about three groups uh, out there when it comes to prayer. Uh, There are those for whom prayer has always been as natural as breathing. For some, that's just their whole life. For others, through, through discipline and, and study and experience, it has just become like that for them. Now, on the other side, there are those among us who prayer is somewhat like uh, removing their own wisdom teeth. And then there's the rest of us. There's somewhere in the middle. Many of us who, who have these grand periods of fruitful prayer... And then also these, these long, desperate, dry spells. For, there are those among us for whom sometimes prayer makes, makes total sense. And, and, and at other times we just have no idea what we're doing. Uh, those of us for whom sometimes it's as though God were just sitting in the room with us. 
And then other times it's though, as though God has taken an extended vacation and forgotten to tell us. Now, Scripture today gives us some good news, fortunately. I think Scripture gives us the good news that when it comes to prayer, we can relax just a little bit. But to get there, we've got to dig into Romans a little bit. It is so very difficult to preach from Romans for me and, and a lot of other pastors because it, at times it feels like the entire letter is just one long run-on sentence. And, and it really becomes difficult to preach on just a little part of it because you almost need to read the whole letter. And honestly, with the Apostle Paul, you should actually read that letter in the context of, of all of Paul's other writings and the accounts in Acts. But we don't have that kind of time today. Oh, unless we do. No, okay. Well, let's, let's back up a little bit. Paul is in this chapter, to, to simplify it just a bit, he's telling us that how through the Spirit of God... Those of us who, who, who have come into relationship with Jesus, through the Spirit of God, we have Christ within us. And this is important, because when we think of prayer in human terms, we think it's almost dualistic. It's us, and then it's God. It's us talking to God, and maybe if we're lucky, God uh, talking back. But Paul reminds us that the Spirit dwells within us and is involved in that prayer. This is a, a great line to frame our, our discussion of prayer when it says, When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very Spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. So when we pray, when we cry out to God, it's not just us is the very Spirit of God praying with us and also reminding us who we are. New Testament scholar C.H. Dodd uh, defines prayer this way. He says, prayer is the divine in us appealing to the divine above us. Now, if we take that seriously, it's either deeply comforting or just a little bit frightening. Now, this sermon might be a little bit complicated, so if you're taking notes, you might want to jot down my first point here so maybe you can remember it when I try to put it all back together. When we pray, it is the very Spirit of God praying with us and reminding us who we are. When we pray, it's the very Spirit of God praying with us and reminding us who we are. And it goes on in verse 17, And if children, then heirs, heirs of God, and joint heirs with Christ, if, in fact, we suffer with him, so that we may also be glorified with him. If we then, children of God, if we are, and if God's Spirit is within us, Paul is saying it's not going to be all cotton candy and unicorns and puppies. Paul is telling us that part of being in unity with Christ is being unified in Christ's suffering. And that's not something that would be a helpful tagline in church marketing. I actually floated it out there. The United Methodist Church, come suffer with us. <laughs> Though if the Apostle Paul was here, he might be like, hey, that's great, we should go with that. Because he saw glory in being united in Christ's suffering. But he also knew that that was not a preferred state or a permanent state of being. So here's another point you might want to jot down if we try to put this together later. When we pray, we need to be aware that being in unity with Christ is being unified in Christ's suffering. And he goes a little bit deeper than that in verse 18. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Now, I think I read this passage at nearly every funeral and memorial service that I do. I hope that it helps us to get some perspective when we're in the midst of grief, tragedy, and loss. 
I think this whole chapter gives us some perspective in that. But when we read it, we tend to think of suffering in, in a very limited view, as though suffering and loss and grief is something that just sort of sneaks into the world. And so everything is good, but every once in a while it just sneaks into the world. But listen, where Paul says in verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. Now, that's a long sentence. But what's he talking about? What is Paul talking about when he's talking about the creation? For the creation was subjected to futility. Paul, is a, Paul was a brilliant theologian, uh, and he knew his scripture. And, and to see what he's talking about, you need to flip all the way back to Genesis chapter 3. If you've got a Bible out, feel free uh, to do that. But uh, I'm going to catch us up a little bit about what's happening in this passage. So the man and the woman are in the garden, and the woman has fallen into the trap of the, the serpent deceiver. And she and the man have eaten the fruit from the one tree in the garden that God said, do not eat from that tree. And from that moment, sin and brokenness entered into uh, the world. The woman and the man committed the transgression, but the rest of, its crea rest of creation that was just minding its own business fell into this. In Genesis chapter 3, verse 17, And to the man he said, Because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil you shall eat of it all the days of your life, thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. When we think about the effects of, of sin and brokenness on humanity and our need for a Savior to rescue us and restore us, we often fail to think much about the creation that has been an unwitting victim of our sin. Back to Romans. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not of its own will, but by the will of the one that subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and will obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. And actually, you know what? That makes sense if you look around at creation. Right? Now, now the issue of global warming has become a, a, another political live wire, so, so let's put that aside for the moment. Just look at the other things that we have done to our planet. We constantly cut down trees and native grasses to make more room for us and for our stuff. We push the wild animals further and further back into the margins. Our oceans are full of garbage. Our streams are polluted. And whether or not the atmosphere is getting warmer, we know that it is full of particulate matter, tons and tons of particulates that we produce traveling around and producing more and more stuff to make our lives easier and more comfortable and more entertaining. And then when we're done with all of our stuff, we just bury it in the earth. Now, things have not been really great for the creation since that little incident in the garden. And things have really not been all that great for us humans. When we dig into Scripture, I mean really dig into Scripture, we see that really horrible things have been happening since just after the garden. I mean, Try reading the, New Test uh, the Old Testament from that perspective uh, sometime. Uh, the Old Testament, in, in some ways, is a chronicle of war and disease and hunger and slavery and violence and betrayal. 
Our, our modern selves didn't invent that stuff. We just got really good at it. Paul says, I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory about to be revealed to us. Here's the thing. We live in this present time. It's still this present time. And, and bad stuff is still happening around us. Okay, so if you're taking notes, that's the next point. This, the suffering of this world is not a temporary anomaly. It, it's the current state of reality. And it goes all the way back to the beginning. The suffering of this world is not a temporary anomaly. It's the current state of reality, and it goes all the way back to the beginning. And it begins to sound here like uh, Paul is really a downer, right? So he has this very bleak view of the world, but not quite. Verse 19, for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. In Greek, that eager longing can also be uh, earnest uh, expectation. Uh, and the word in Greek actually conveys this idea of, of looking towards something with your head bent forward, like really looking for something. Now picture yourself at uh, Cadillac Mountain in Acadia National Park in Maine, it's one of three places in Maine to claim that they are the first place the sun rises on the entire United States where you could first see a glimpse of the sun. Now, for people who have made that trek, when it gets to be about that time, they're not looking at anything else but the horizon. Heads pushed forward for that instant when dawn breaks. All of your focus and attention, even your, your physical body, aimed at the horizon waiting for the breaking of dawn. And as Christians, that's part of what we are doing. For while the promises of God's restoration are not uh, fully realized, we see brief glimpses of heaven breaking in. We lean forward to see those glimpses in our 815 service in here this morning, we got one of those glimpses as we gather around the Lord's table for communion in that place where the, the distance between heaven and earth grows strangely thin. And just for a moment, if you look carefully, you can see what God has in store for all creation. Sometimes we, as the church here or as we go out with our hands and feet, can become those glimpses. And sometimes we see those glimpses when we are at prayer. Okay, so that's another piece. While the world is filled with brokenness and suffering, we keep our eyes open and remain watchful for the coming redemption. While the world is filled with brokenness and suffering, keep our eyes open and watchful for the coming redemption. We know that the whole creation has been growing in labor pains until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit grown inwardly while we wait for adoption for the redemption of our bodies. For in hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Now I would understand at this point you might be sitting in your pew going, wait a minute, wasn't this a sermon about prayer? How do we get into decay and suffering and futility? Oh, yes. Well, it's okay. All of this other stuff, I think, was necessary to, to get clearly to the point. So let's review all the points. Number one, when we pray, it is the very Spirit of God praying within us and reminding us of who we are, and that is children of God. Then, when we pray, we need to be aware that being in unity with Christ is being unified in Christ's suffering. And then that, that suffering, the suffering of the world, is not a, a temporary uh, anomaly. It's the current state of reality, which goes all the way back to the beginning. And then while the world is full of brokenness and suffering, we keep our eyes focused and remain watchful for the coming redemption. 
And so when I worked on this sermon this week, I got to that point and I said, well, what am I supposed to say about prayer? I almost sort of gave up and was going to end the sermon here and told you to come back next week. But that's why I like this part. And that's uh, verse 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought. But that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. The Apostle Paul has bookended this whole section, starting out with when we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God, and then coming back to say, likewise, the spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And I think that might be one of the most amazingly delightful pieces of scripture in the whole book, if not one of the most amazing lines in all of literature. It is one that we should keep close to our hearts when we pray. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness, for we do not know how to pray as we ought, but that very Spirit intercedes with sighs too deep for words. And then it goes on and God who searches the heart knows what is the mind of the Spirit because the Spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. When we pray, it is the very Spirit of God within us, praying with us and reminding us of who we are. When we pray, we need to be aware that being in unity with Christ means being unified in Christ's suffering. The suffering of this world is not a temporary anomaly. It's the current state of reality. And while the world is filled with brokenness and suffering, we still keep our eyes on what is coming. And when we just don't know how to pray, the Spirit steps in. So, so what does this mean? It's a question I get a lot. What are we to do? Knowing that the very Spirit of God is within us, that prayer is the divine in us appealing to the divine above us, we pray. Knowing that suffering is the reality that we face, we pray. Knowing that as Christians we're actually called to be a part of the suffering of Christ, we pray. Knowing that in the, the world, this brokenness, these bad things can happen, we pray. And in the midst of it, as we gaze at the horizon in anticipation, we pray. Knowing that the Spirit prays for us, we pray. So what are we to do? We're to pray, and we're to pray because Jesus told us to. In Matthew chapter 7, verse 7, Ask it will be given to you. Search and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and everyone who searches finds. And for everyone who knocks, the door will be open. So what are we to do? Pray. Because Scripture tells us to. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6, Do not worry about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. So what are we to do? Pray. Because prayer matters, and prayer works. Now, I don't know why sometimes prayer moves mountains, and other times our prayers feel like they're just dissipating into nothing. I don't know why sometimes when we pray, things happen that are beyond explanation. I don't know why when sometimes we, we pray and cancer goes into remission or someone in hospice walks out restored to health or money appears to a family that is just about to be evicted, or hopeless addiction is banished, granting someone a new chance at life. But I do know those things happen when we pray. But sometimes we pray with absolute clarity for a life. Sometimes we pray with absolute 
clarity for pain to go away. Sometimes we pray with absolute clarity for a marriage to be saved. And nothing seems to happen. And we don't know what to say. And we have all these platitudes. Well, it wasn't God's will. Or it wasn't God's time. Or maybe we didn't pray right. Or maybe we didn't have enough faith. Or maybe we didn't pray enough. Or maybe God answered in another way. Sure, fine, maybe. I don't know. I'm not God. But the Spirit of God within us is speaking to the God above us. I honestly don't know exactly what is happening, and I don't need to. I don't need to explain it. I don't need to understand it. I just need to pray and trust and have hope. For in hope we are saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what is seen? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. So what are we to do? Pray. Because you know what? Prayer changes us. When we cry, Abba, Father, it is that very spirit bearing witness with our spirit that we are children of God. If prayer is the spirit of God within us, joining with the God above us, it is going to have a radical impact on us as human beings. So what are we to do? Pray. Because why wouldn't we? If prayer is the Spirit of God within us, joining with the Spirit of God above us, and that Spirit will step in with sighs too deep for words when we do not know what to say, what to ask for, or even what we really need, why wouldn't we do that? So what are we to do? pray because I think we want to be in a relationship with God and that's what you do when you're in relationships so my dad uh, is now in his late 80s uh, and his health continues to deteriorate and his mind is, is starting to fade and so when I call him we have about the same conversation every time and he asks me the same questions that he asked me the last time, and I give the same answers. And he's delighted that I called him. Because I'm his son. I, I can only think our graceful God finds the same joy when we take time to pray. So what are we to do? Pray. Because Jesus did. In Mark chapter 14, verses 35 and 36, and going a little farther, he threw himself on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. He said, Abba, Father, for you all things are possible. Remove this cup from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. I would find that to be just one of the most fascinating pieces of Scripture. The Son of God speaking to God, knowing full well the horrible thing that was going to happen, but still praying. And you know what? I think that Jesus knew that we would struggle with prayer. It's so complicated. What do we say? What do we do? How do we do it right? And so he told us what to say. In Luke chapter 11, Jesus was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, Teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. He said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread. And forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And do not bring us to the time of trial. Amen.